Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another installment in Physics 144. Today we are talking about work and energy. So last time we talked about work and energy uh, in the context of defining work and talking about how work done on a system will change its kinetic energy. Today we're going to develop the ideas of potential energy and we're going to explore what kind of forces have potential energies and what kind of forces don't. And I'm going to give the answer away right away, which is this idea that we brought up at the end of last lecture, which is the idea of path dependence. Um, and the nutshell of this is that forces that do not depend on the path that they take will have associated potential energies, but forces that are path dependent cannot have a potential energy. I haven't even told you what a potential is, but your experience in physics has probably brought up this idea of a potential energy before. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of connect last week's lecture to this week's lecture to note that the key idea that will be circling around throughout this uh, lecture is this idea of path dependence. So let's get started by thinking about what it means for something to be path dependent and explore the ideas of um, uh, work in the context of paths a little bit more. Then we'll move on to develop the idea of potential energy. To explore this idea of path dependence, let's consider the force of gravity which just has, in this simple model, uh, the force is mg pointed downward. Uh, let's call that a, it's a vector, keep things straight. And then we have an x and a y direction for the uh, orientation of the problem. Now we'll consider the work done over three separate paths, the blue path, the green path, and the red path. And when we're thinking about that, we think about work in the context of the integral of f dot ds. And I'm going to take three separate routes to get to the same point. Now, this is mostly to expose the idea of how do we start to mathematically formulate path integrals. And the thing that we do is we're going to first do this uh, first path over path one, and then over path two to get up to the first point. So I'm going to consider my work is my integral from 0, 0 to 3, 0. And I'm going to just drop units uh, to get started here. And I'm going to consider that as f dot ds. And for this path, my little ds is going to have a form dx, so it's going to be a step in the x direction, and it's going to be along the unit vector i hat. And this just says that if I'm moving along path number one right here, I'm going to be stepping in the x direction, and so that follows the little i hat unit vector. Therefore, my um, path integral is going to look like this. It's going to go from x equals 0, y equals 0, to x equals 3, y equals 0, of the force, which is minus mg j hat, dotted with my ds, which is going to be dx in the i hat direction. And since i and j are perpendicular unit vectors, this dot product is going to be 0. So it's going to be the integral of 0 over that path, which is, in turn, 0. So that takes care of the first path, and it kind of makes sense. We move horizontally, the force is vertically, those two forces are perpendicular, the work done must be zero. This little mathematical formulation gives us the same answer, the one we expect. So, so far, so good. Um, let's try path number two. That was path one. Let's do path number two. Now, path number two, we are going from the point three, zero, up to the point three, two of f dot ds. And in this case, my little uh, step is along the y direction. And so my ds there is going to have the form dy in the, oops, that's not a j hat by a mile. That's a j hat. And then I'll stick in this. So it's a little step in the y direction. And we go from 3, 0 up to 3, 2 of minus m g j hat dotted with d y j hat. 
And so the j hat dot j hat's just going to go to one. And so this is going to go from three zero up to three two of minus m g d y. And then that's going to be equal to minus m g evaluated at x equals three, y equals zero, oh, sorry, it's m g y. And then this is up to three comma two. And so this is m times g times, um, we're going to plug in the x values of three, but there's no x's that appear here, so we just ignore it. This doesn't depend on x. But then we plug in two minus an, uh, m g times zero, and so this is negative two m g uh, there as the um, work done along path two. And so the total for this is just going to be the work which is going to be um, negative 2mg. Okay, so this sets up uh, how we'll approach the others. And uh, I'll go through those a little more quickly, just to uh, be clear. And then uh, I'll do the other branch. So I'll do path 3 and path 4 to kind of illustrate what's happening here. Uh, for path 3, I'm going to say that this has work is going to be the integral from 0, 0 up to 0, 2 of the force, which is minus mg j hat. And then my ds is going to be stepping in the y direction. It's going to be dy in the j hat direction again. And so then that's going to just go to 0, 0 to 0, 2 of minus m g dy. I'll integrate that and I'll get that that's equal to minus m g y evaluated at x equals 0, y equals 0 to x equals 0, y equals 2. And uh, when I plug in the numbers, I get that this is minus 2 m g that's the top. Again, there's no x dependence, so I only stick in the y equals 2 part into that y. And I get the minus 2mg, and then that is minus 0, which again is minus 2mg. Along path 4, we have that the force is once again perpendicular to the vector that we're stepping with, the dx in the x direction. So this is just like what happened up here with path one, and so that's going to reduce down to zero. And so that result gives me um, that the path along the red path, so three plus four, is going to be equal to minus two mg. Oh, once again, that's the same answer. So this object doesn't depend on the path that I take, or this force doesn't depend on the path that I take. Um, the last thing to consider is what happens if we take this green path? And I'm going to give away the answer. It's going to be the same result, but let's see how we get there. That's the, 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 the challenge here is how to formulate the path rather than the mathematics itself or expecting to get a different answer. So let's consider what happens if we go after path number five. Let's see if we find something that'll work here. That's a different color. So this is path five. And path five is a little weird because it's not immediately in the x direction, nor is it in the y direction. And in fact, it goes from zero, zero to x equals three, y equals two. And so this is going to follow the line. So this follows the line y is equal to 2 thirds times x. The slope of this line, so it's the slope of 2 thirds, slope equals 2 thirds. y-intercept is 0 because it goes through the origin. So this equation of the line is y is equal to 2 thirds x. So that means that a step in the y direction is going to have uh, is going to be like taking a step in two-thirds times the step in the x-direction. So this is basically telling us the size of the steps 
And to see that, what we do is we take dy by dx, which is d by dx of 2 thirds x, which is just equal to 2 thirds. So then we do dy over dx equals 2 thirds, and we multiply up by that little step dx. Again, mathematicians hate us when you hate it, but um, physicists live in a smooth differentiable world, which tells us we can get away with it. Okay. So that just tells me the step sizes. The actual step vector, ds, is going to be a step in the x direction along the x-axis, i hat, uh, plus a step in the y direction along the j-axis, or the y-axis. And from before, we have that this is dx times i hat. We'll just leave that alone. But then this slope tells me that this is equal to 2 thirds dx j hat. And so what we can do is carry out an integral by saying the integral, the work, is the integral from 0, 0 to uh, 3, comma, 2 of f dot ds. My force vector here is, uh, so I'm going to roll 0, 0 to 3, comma 2. My force vector is minus mg j hat, and that's going to be dot product with um, dx i hat plus 2 thirds uh, dx j hat. And so what we'll do is we take the dot products, i dot j term will go away because uh, it's perpendicular, so that goes to zero. And then the other term is just going to give me integral 0, 0 to 3, comma 2 of minus m g, j dot j is uh, times 2 thirds times dx, and that's going to be 0, 0 to, uh, well, let's actually carry out the integral. So that's mg times 2 thirds times dx. So that's going to be minus 2 thirds mg. There's no x's, so we add 1 to the power, leaving 1x. x evaluated from 0, 0 to 3, comma 2. And then we plug in our x value. So it's negative 2 thirds mg times 3 minus 0, which is, once again, minus 2mg. So the key to this mathematics is this part right here, where we express our path uh, integral as a little step in the x direction times i hat, and a little step in the y direction times j hat. That's right here. And then we use the expression for our path to replace one of them. We'll replace the dy with a 2 thirds dx. And that allows the rest of this math to come down and give us the same answer. So that's a little example of how we actually do the mathematics of the paths. The physics point, however, is that every one of these uh, paths gives us the same work as we go from one end of the path to the next end of the path. And when that happens, we have the capacity to define a potential energy. So the work, uh, in this case done by gravity, only depends on the start and the end points. It doesn't depend on how you get there. And this is true for any path dealing with gravity. And because of this, we can go ahead and establish a definition for the gravitational potential energy which is mg times y, where my y position may be mg times h, which is the height. Uh, we've seen that before. Um, and so we want to just note that if we define that to be the gravitational potential energy, then the work done by gravity as I lift from a low point, y1, up to a high point, that's y2 up here, is going to be mgy1 minus mgy2. That's because we're starting uh, low and we are going up high and we're going opposite the path of gravity. So we get negative mgy2 uh, plus mgy1. 
and that gives me as minus mg y2 minus y1. And if we use this as our definition of the gravitational potential energy, then that's going to be negative times the change in the gravitational potential. So uh, we could say that the work done by gravity changes the kinetic energy of the system or uh, it changes the negative gravitational potential energy of the system. And so that means that the kinetic energy change plus the gravitational binding energy change will be uh, zero. So this is fundamentally a statement of energy conservation, which is the change in kinetic plus the change in the potential energies for gravity and the kinetic energies is going to be zero. So we can sort of see an example of that with this little uh, force bubble here uh, that we have, uh, like so. So this is a little skateboarder at the physics skate park, and we can put them onto the track, which is uh, frictionless in uh, this case, and they will bounce back and forth. And uh, what we'll see is the uh, interchange of gravitational and uh, potential energy and kinetic energy. And you can sort of see this per uh, the person moving back and forth as gravity does work, increases their kinetic energy, and then their kinetic energy goes down as gravity does negative work on the system, uh, slowing them down to bring them to a halt. But this means uh, that it's actually storing energy in a potential energy configuration. Uh, so we end up with a uh, idea where we have this total energy conservation, where the total energy is the same, uh, and it's just changing forms from kinetic to potential energy. So uh, there's uh, important things to note about our little scenario here is the uh, only the change in height in the vertical direction matters. We can give a different uh, path, but put them at the same height. And the only thing that matters is how much they are moving up and down, not uh, the left or right or the shape of the path or anything. It only depends on the vertical displacement uh, of the energy, which is kind of interesting because it means that something about height matters. But having that statement is kind of a little problematic because it's the height or the altitude with respect to what? And so you can think about a case like, uh, you know, what about your potential energy with respect to the center of the Earth? Well, you have a huge potential energy with respect to the center of the Earth, but you can't convert that all into kinetic energy. You'd hit the ground or something like that. Um, and so whenever we're talking about potential energies, we need to pick a particular zero point and the potential energy all it doesn't matter what that point is but you have to define it it's just like a coordinate system we pick a point where the gravitational energy is zero and then we measure everything with respect to that zero point so closely related um the uh or closely related to this is the idea that only changes in energy have real physical meaning uh, and not the actual values of the gravitational potential energy. You just pick a zero point that makes your math work out pretty well, and it's only the changes that actually come into the math. If you have something that depends on the absolute value of the potential, you're, you know, it's, it's not going to be intrinsically correct. You can only uh, calculate things with respect to differences in gravitational or kinetic energy. So this is the expression of the conservation of energy for a system, except instead of a zero over here, I'm going to highlight that this is W. This is the work that is done, and here's the convention, it is on the system. So if this is the total energy on the left-hand side, the work done on the system will increase the energy of the system. And similarly, if the system does work or, uh, or does positive work on its environment, or negative work is done on whatever system we are considering, then uh, we will reduce the energy of this. So uh, the convention is on, so positive means where energy flows into the system.
Usually this work term is the place where we keep track of our non-conservative forces. Uh, that's a great place to stick uh, anything like friction or all those pesky path-dependent forces. Now, to um, remind you, there's also another potential energy that we've dealt with because we have another path independent force. That's the spring, which we kind of argued based on the hippo uh, case uh, at the end of last lecture. Uh, and so the spring potential energy has a form of one half kx squared, where x is the distance that a spring is compressed. And so you can think about that the potential energy is the negative of the work done on the object. And so if I push it from zero to the final, I get that the uh, actual work done on it is minus one half k delta x squared, and that is the change in the spring potential energy. And so the positive value of this becomes the spring potential. So let's try out a couple examples of conservation of energy. Uh, in this case, we have a small block of mass m sliding down a frictionless ramp uh, around a frictionless circular loop-de-loop, -loop, and then uh, we are going to have it not fall off at the top of the uh, loop. So we want to consider two cases. First is an initial case of the energy, and then we want to consider the final energy. We're going to set our potential to be zero uh, for the bottom of the loop. And in that case, we have the final energy minus the initial energy for the system is going to be equal to zero uh, because there's no work done on it because frictionless. And then my final energy is going to be equal to my initial energy. Well, the uh, let's uh, the final energy is going to be uh, some gravitational potential energy U G final plus the kinetic energy final, and the initial energy is just M G H uh, plus zero uh, is the initial kinetic energy. Uh, the Gravitational energy at the final point is some distance h, and then we're going to take off 2r. That's this distance here. So 2 times r, and so the actual distance above here is just going to be 2r above the base here. So this is going to be mg times 2r, and then we're going to have this be 1 half mv squared is equal to mgh. Okay, so we've used energy, uh, but we've got a problem is we don't know anything about what V squared has to be there. It's not zero because it's zero at rest here. So it's gonna be moving at some speed. So we need some other criterion to understand what V squared is going to be. Well, it's a good thing we have a circular loop-de-loop because -loop, that means that we know that when it's on there at that point EF, the speed or v squared over r must be equal to the normal component of the acceleration, where this is a sub m pointing down there. We also know that that acceleration, m times a sub n, must be provided by gravity, mg, plus a normal force. So we think about mg going down, and then we have a normal force going down but we want the minimum height. And so the minimum height translates into the slowest possible speed. And so we're going to consider the n equals zero, no normal force case. It's just barely uh, free falling its way into contact with the track as it goes across the top of the loop. The loop. And in that case, we get that m v squared over r is equal to m g, or solving for v squared, we get v squared cancel the m's is equal to r g. And so this is the way that we're going to get away with solving for uh, the kinetic energy. We're going to say it has to be equal to r g. So then we get m g times 2 r plus 1 half m times rg is equal to mgh. And at this point, we can cancel out an mg from every term. And we are left with an expression that says uh, 2r plus a half r is 5 halves r is equal to 
H. And that is what we actually came for. So we figure out that the height has to be five halves times the radius of the loop. Okay, great. We got that all out of energy. Now I want to make a point here that uh, work energy uh, theorem that we did last time and this treatment of potential energies is basically two sides of the same coin. And then we'll understand why one gives us one approach and one gives another approach next. And to illustrate that, I want to consider this scenario. Uh, as you do, we are launching a birthday cake uh, a distance uh, across a table with kinetic friction at an initial speed v naught, and it's going to hit this spring and compress it. And we want to know how we would express this using work energy. Heck, we did some problems about this last week, so we're all set to try it out. Uh, we would approach this by saying that um, in this case, we have the change in kinetic energies in the system is the work that's done by the spring, and then the work that's done by friction. Well, the final kinetic energy is zero because it compresses and then comes to rest uh, over here. The initial kinetic energy is one half mv zero squared, so it's traveling this way, and then there's a minus sign that shows up here. So that's the change in kinetic energy. It goes from, uh, it, it is negative because we are slowing down the system. Uh, then, we want to consider the works done by the spring. Well, that we just did. Uh, it is opposite to the direction of motion, so it does negative work equal to one half kx squared, variable force length. And then we want to consider the work done by friction, which is just mu mg, or mu sub k mg, times the distance traveled, which goes until, across the table till it hits the spring and then continues past it to uh, compress it by a distance delta x, which will be that way, or x. And therefore, the work done by friction is d plus x times mu mg. And that's also negative because friction is acting opposite the direction of motion. And we're just going to bookkeep this by pulling this all over uh, to the left-hand side and say that this is 1 half kx squared plus mu mg dx minus 1 half mv naught squared. So it gives us one expression uh, that we could analyze and use to solve the problem. So that's the work energy formulation. We considered a change in kinetic energy in the system as a result of work done by the spring and work done by friction. But we can also consider this in the context of uh, just the energy conservation of the system, where we consider the spring potential final and the kinetic potential the kinetic energy for the final. So this is E final minus E initial is equal to the work done on the system. Uh, we just walk through the final energies. The initial is the spring's initial energy plus the kinetic energy initially. And then the work done on the system is just the work. Uh, so as the spring gets compressed, that means it picks up a spring potential energy one half kx squared. The final kinetic energy is zero minus the spring potential energy initially. Well, it's not compressed at all as the cake is flying across here. So it has a value of zero. And then the kinetic energy initially is just the one half mv squared. Okay, all reasonable. And then we get that this is minus mu mg d plus x. And that's the work that's done by friction, same as it was last time. Uh, to give us the effect on, uh, of, you know, the loss of energy of the final minus the initial uh, energy in the system. And if you push this over and work out the math here, you will find that these two equations are literally the same equation. The math is absolutely the same, but I consider some cases had a potential energy of the spring and some had the work done by a spring. They just appear on different sides of the equation. And the distinction as to whether it's on the energy side of the equation versus the work side of the equation is just how we have defined our system. So we can then kind of augment everything in terms of conservation of energy to think about 
all these different effects where we have all of our potential energies, our kinetic energies, and then we'll bookkeep things like chemical energy. And this is where the energy formalism becomes super powerful as so we can keep track of all kinds of energetics uh, using this uh, model. Similarly, we can consider the work done on the system and then heat flowing into the system or say uh, mass transfer, like adding fuel would uh, carry with it some energy associated with it. And so we can consider a very well-developed expression of conservation of energy and just add more and more and more ornaments to it. However, we'll often consider isolated systems. And this is mostly just one of those physics uh, lawyer words is that whenever we say isolated, that really means that there is no transfer of energy across the boundary of the system. And therefore energy is conserved within the system as a whole. Okay, I've been saying the word system an awful lot. And now it's time, now that we've sort of seen how the framework uh, works out here, it's really a good point to kind of think about what a system means. Like, what does that word actually mean? Well, it is the definition of whether we have work energy versus the conservation of energy. And here's the big kind of takeaway message is, is that any pairs of forces that are inside the system are considered with energies, usually with potential energies. And so this is Newton third law pairs of forces that are inside the system. Those get associated with energies and appear on the energy side of the equation. Forces that are outside of the systems must be treated using work and the approach of work here. So let's take an example here. Uh, we have a little uh, person here who is uh, some sort of generic block-like toy uh, that is pulling a gumdrop along the ground at a constant speed. Uh, there's going to be some interaction between the earth, the gumdrop, and the person. And we want to consider just the system to be the gumdrop and the earth here so that the person is outside of it and they're going to move this gumdrop through a displacement delta s. Well, there's lots of forces. And if we assume that they are in translational equilibrium, so there's uh, ex neither acceleration nor deceleration, all these forces must have of the same magnitude. So on the gumdrop, there's going to be two forces. First is the force of the person pulling on the gumdrop with that rope. If it's in translational equilibrium, the earth must be exerting a force on the gumdrop backward, otherwise the gumdrop would accelerate. And it doesn't. So this is probably a friction force. E F sub E G is probably friction. If we consider the whole system to include Earth and the gumdrop, as we have done here, there's also two other forces acting on the Earth. The person is pushing on the Earth, and so he's pushing the Earth backwards with the, the little Lego, I'm sorry, the little generic toy feet uh, pushing backwards uh, there. And then the gumdrop, uh, because we have a friction force from the earth on the gumdrop, there is a Newton third law force acting down here, pushing the earth uh, forward. And so this gives us our system here, and we have all of these forces. And similarly, there's a the force of a gumdrop on the person and a force of the earth on the person. Again, these forces of the earth are probably friction forces, as is the person on the earth uh, and the gumdrop on the earth and the earth uh, on the gumdrop. So this is basically the whole setup and thinking about it in terms of forces, we get all of this. Now, in this translational equilibrium, there are two forces that are external to the system. Those are the things that are created by the person acting on something in the system. The force of the person on the gumdrop, the force of the person on the earth. These are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And so these forces uh, would, in theory, kind of cancel out. And in terms of sort of vector operations, they do. They, uh, but as we stressed through Newton's second law, 
you pay attention, they are acting on different objects, even though both objects are in the system. But they are both being acted on something in the system. So it seems like you might think, well, what if, like, if the forces are opposite and have equal magnitude, aren't they going to just lead to no work? And the difference is not in the forces. The forces balance. The force of the person on the gumdrop is negative the force of the person on the earth. But there is nonetheless work done because the work done on the gumdrop is the force times the displacement. And so the gumdrop moves a displacement, but the earth, because it is 26 orders of magnitude more uh, and massive than the gumdrop, still a big gumdrop, uh, we end up with the earth moving nowhere, and therefore the force of the person on the earth does no work, though the force of the person on the gumdrop does do work. And so this imbalance in how much things move leads to the ability for energy to be transferred in and out of systems, even though their forces are the same magnitude. So this illustrates two important points. Uh, the first is that we have systems and systems define the and the boundaries of the systems define whether we keep things track of them as energies or we keep track of things in terms of uh, external work uh, on it. And then it also illustrates that even though all the forces can be equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, you can still have a net flow of work because the displacements change. All right, so let's do um, a conservation of energy problem in kind of all its gory detail. And here's this problem. So we have a block uh, on a ramp that has friction on it, uh, and it's attached to a spring and a rope, and that rope goes over a frictionless massless pulley, attaches to M2. And what we're going to do is we're going to drop M2 by a distance of delta Y, and as a result, M1 is going to move up the ramp by a distance, delta Y. That's going to stretch the spring. That's going to lift it upward. It's going to drag it along the ground so that there's work done on the system. So we're going to approach this because we only need to find the speed. We're going to use a work energy model here. So let's uh, start out by writing down energy conservation, which says that the final energy minus the initial energy is equal to the work that's done on the system. The final energy is just going to be whatever the final kinetic energy is, plus the gravitational potential energy, final, plus the spring potential energy, final, minus, and we have the initial kinetic energy, plus the gravitational potential energy, plus the spring potential energy, all in the initial state, and that's equal to the work that's done on the system. In this case, it will be done by friction, uh, as the you know that's where we bookkeep all our non-conservative forces. Well, uh, this is a nice case because we start out at rest, so the initial kinetic energy of the two blocks is zero, and I'm going to define the initial state to have zero potential energy. And so these, I'm going to set those last two terms to be zero. So I can do this by definition. Definition. Because I get to choose where my energies start, uh, my potential energies start at, and I choose the initial state. Thus, we can write down these with a little bit more physics detail. So let's start out with the kinetic energy. There are two blocks, uh, and they are both going to end up moving at speed v. So we do 1 half m1v squared plus 1 half m2v squared. So that's the total kinetic energy of the system. And then we write down the gravitational potential energy of the system. So block m1 moves up the ramp a distance delta y, but it moves vertically a distance delta y times sine theta, where theta is this angle down here. So we get that the potential increases by m1 g delta y times sine theta. And then m2 drops by a distance of delta y. So this is minus m2 g delta y 
No trig term, because it's just falling vertically. Then we put in the spring uh, potential, which is plus uh, 1 half k, and it gets stretched by a distance delta y, so the total energy in the spring then becomes delta y squared. And then we figure out what the work done on the system is. Well, that's going to be from the friction force. The friction force is going to have a magnitude of mu k times n, which is mu k times mg cos theta, and this is m1g, because we have two masses running around here. Uh, and that's just the normal force uh, of the block on the ramp. And then the work done is going to be minus mu k m1g cos theta times the distance it gets dragged, delta y. Okay, we've done all the physics. Now it's all over but the algebra. Let's go ahead and isolate for our v squareds there. So first, let's uh, collect things up and say this is 1 half m1 plus m2 times v squared. And then I'm going to get that uh, on one side, uh, and then I'm going to push everything else to the other side of the equation. So I'll get that this is m2g delta y minus m1g delta y sine theta uh, minus 1 half k delta y quantity squared minus mu k m1g cos theta delta y. And I'll just tidy things up a little bit here. So this becomes, pull out a g delta y times m2 minus m1 sine theta minus mu k m2 m1 cos theta all minus one half k times delta y quantity squared uh, is equal to one half m1 plus m2 v squared. Then we can solve for v. And so we get that v is equal to big brackets uh, g uh, 2g delta y over m1 plus m2 uh, times, whoops, uh, m2 minus m1 sine theta minus mu k m1 cos theta uh, minus, uh, we get a two and a half cancel out. So we get um, k delta y quantity squared over m1 plus m2. This is all in the big brackets. Take a square root and we can plug everything in. Uh, and at this point, I will substitute. I can substitute in values. I'm going to note that this 36.87 is the angle you get in a 345 uh, right triangle, and therefore the cosine of theta is 30 three fifths. So that's adjacent over. That's the adjacent over the hypotenuse, and then the sine theta is four fifths. So sine theta equal to four-fifths. And if we plug in those values, three-fifths, four-fifths, and then the values given in the problem, uh, we'll get down to 1.39 meters per second, uh, which you can check on your own uh, as an exploration of physics on your own. So, whew. all right, the next thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, the relationship between forces and potential energies. And for forces that have a uh, potential energy, we found that if we consider the work uh, as the force uh, integrated over distance from an initial to a final step, that was the work. And we defined that as the negative change in the potential energy from x initial to x final. But in calculus, as you go through your math, you will learn that integrals and derivatives are opposites. They uh, basically, derivatives undo integrals and integrals undo derivatives. Uh, and so integrals are often called the antiderivative. And if we just apply, take a basically a derivative of this first equation, we find that the force can be derived from a potential 
by taking the derivative of it with respect to a spatial direction and then sticking on this minus sign, same negative sign right there. So if we consider this for springs, the spring potential is 1 half kx squared. We take the d by dx of it, that's 1 half kx squared, take the derivative minus, and we get Hooke's law negative kx. So as promised, this kind of undoes everything and it gives us a relationship where we can, if we know a potential, we can figure out the force field associated with that. So this is just an example of it right here. If I have a uh, generic potential uh, like ux is ax squared plus uh, bx to the fourth, and I give you some constants for a and b, I wonder what the force on this particle is at x equals negative one. Well, the force is negative derivative with respect to x. And then I take that derivative. Uh, so we take the derivative of this function right there, and it's going to be negative bracket 2a, drop one power of x down, 2ax plus bx cubed uh, times 4. The 4 comes down. And then if I'm given the answer of like what's the force at a position, we then substitute in x equals 1. So we get that this is equal to minus 2 times a, which is negative 3 joules per meter squared. And then I stick in a value of negative 1 meters. And then this negative sign distributes in minus 4 times b, 1 joule per meter to the fourth power, times negative 1 meter cubed, and so we do the math, and so this becomes 6 joules per meter minus uh, 4 uh, joules per meter. Oh, sorry, negative, negative, negative is negative 6 joules per meter uh, minus negative plus 4 joules per meter, and this becomes negative 2 joules per meter. But of course, a joule per meter is a newton, so negative 2 newtons. And if we look at our little graph right here, uh, this is the potential at x equals 1, we measure on down, and this point right here is the force that we're uh, talking about, and it says that this force at that point, this is a one-dimensional force, it's pushing that way with a force of negative 2 newtons. So this gives us a way, if we know a potential up here, we are able to figure out a force by just taking its derivative and substituting in. Okay, well, that's a kind of toy model. We can deal with something a little bit more real. Um, this is a uh, potential energy for a molecule. So a diatomic molecule, like say, molecular hydrogen or carbon monoxide or something like that, the energy, uh, potential energy associated with that chemical bond has a form of u of r, which is a over r to the 12th minus b over r to the 6th. And a and b are constants that depend on the atom. And so we can figure out uh, where, uh, if this is the potential set by the electronic interactions within the molecule, this is a good model for it, uh, then we get uh, a shape like this. And it's kind of representing the idea that if we pull the two atoms far apart, their potential energy goes to zero. They actually dissociate with each other and they get separated. That's represented by this mess here. And if we push them too close together, all of the electrons in the atoms are going to see the other electrons and negative charges repel. So the screening effect uh, sort of pushes away. Uh, so the electrons flee to the opposite sides of, the, of their respective atoms, exposing the positive charges inside, which then also have a strong uh, dipole or a strong Coulomb interaction and the whole molecule gets pushed apart and that represents this sudden rise in potential energy if we try to squeeze the molecule uh, together. So this is a good force model for a molecule and if we have this potential we can figure out some stuff about molecules like how far apart they are in terms of the energy coefficients A and B. So if we need to figure out what the force between the atom is, we just say that the force as a function of how far apart those are is negative the derivative with respect to R. And then we just take the negative derivative of this expression up here. So this becomes 
r to the negative 12 become the derivative is negative 12 times a over subtract 1 from negative 12 becomes r to the negative 13 minus b oops sorry minus a negative 6 b over r to the seventh okay so that's what the force uh, is and if we're in equilibrium that force needs to go to zero so to figure out the equilibrium we take minus 12a over r to the 13th ridiculous force plus 6b over r to the 7 set it equal to zero and proceed to solve so we'll just say that 6b over r to the 7 is equal to 12a over r to the 13th, and we will cross multiply up those terms. So we get 6r to the 13th b is equal to 12a r to the 7th. Uh, we'll cancel. So then we get r to the 6 is equal to 2a over b, or r at equilibrium is just 2a over b to the 1 6th power and a and b have units to make that actually work out amazingly i'm sure so then we can also figure out the depth of this potential well so this figures out where the x position is and then we just say well what is the y position and to figure that out we just evaluate what the potential is at r equals 2a over b to the 1 6th power and uh well let's let's plug it in so we get that this is uh a over 2a over b to the 1 6th power let's uh draw my brackets in a sane way uh to the 1 6th power raised to the 12th power minus b over 2a over b raised to the 1 6th power raised to the 6th power and then i stick this in um, so this becomes a over uh, 2a over b quantity squared minus b over um, a sixth of the sixth power is 1 so 2a over b and then let's come on up here and we'll get a over 4a squared times b squared minus uh, b squared over 2a these two a's will cancel i'll pull out a b squared and that will leave the over a and that will leave a one fourth minus a half and then we can uh, just write this down as minus b squared over 4a and this is the potential at the equilibrium bonding distance uh, whatever that is and so actually you can also run this the other way which is if you know the dissociation energy of the molecule and you also know the size of the molecule then you can figure out what these coefficients are in the potential of your diatomic uh, diatomic molecule so it's pretty cool that these potentials and the forces associated with them can actually be used to understand things like the intermolecular uh intramolecular bonding um and such as long as we have a reasonable force model don't ask me how to derive this uh it's a secret okay uh so related uh closely related to the idea of these potentials is that we can also look at a curve of potential u as a function of x and interpret it in the context of forces and the shape of this energy diagram identifies equilibrium points and can also tell you whether those equilibrium points are stable or unstable and uh, let's fill out what we mean by that so first off we know that the derivative of a potential energy curve uh, is going to give us the force or the negative derivative of it and so if we know the negative derivative of the potential we can look for equilibrium points which is where that force goes to zero and where the derivative of zero is, is the local maximum and the minimum of the potential. So that's the uh, highs and lows of the potential. Those are the equilibrium points. 
then the next thing you can think about, and so if you think about what this means, is that if this uh, force is a um, sort of heading downward, or the potential is heading downward, that means it has a negative derivative, and then the negative of a negative derivative is positive, that corresponds to the force pointing it being positive, which means it's pointing in the x direction. Okay, so if the potential is then increasing as we move from left to right, uh, the derivative of that will be positive, the negative derivative of that, which will be the force field, will be negative, and so the force is negative, and that corresponds to pointing in the negative x direction. Similarly, the downhill is pointing in the plus x, and then the uphill portion of the potential is pointing in the negative x. So we can relate the force and the potential uh, curve of the, uh, uh, the force and the potential curve through this derivative relationship. So the next question is whether it is a stable or unstable point. And that means that if I start something at a point, say up here, and I give it a little nudge off to one side or the other, does it return to where it came from? So if we think about what happens at this top point right here, if I give it a nudge to the left, the force is pointing in the negative direction or to the left. And so it's going to get accelerated away from that equilibrium point. Similarly, if I give it a nudge to the right, the force is pointing in the right direction, and so it will accelerate to the right away from that point. So we call this point up here unstable equilibrium. And that's associated with a local maximum in the potential energy. Uh, similarly, if we look at the bottom point here, uh, if we give it a little push to the left, the force is pushing to the right. And so this means it gives us a restoring force and returns it to uh, the uh, local minimum uh, of the potential. And similarly, if we perturb it off to the right, the force is pointing opposite that. And so it'll push it back to the point there. And so this is called a stable equilibrium. And uh, you can sort of see that in our uh, delightful little um, skate park here. So uh, we have a uh, skate uh, human here, and the skate human is going to uh, move away from a local maximum and back to it and um, get sort of perturbed away by the shape of the potential. And whenever I'm thinking about potential energy curves, this is actually the mental model I have in my head, is I think about this in terms of just sort of a uniform gravitational field pointing down, and that turns out to be a pretty good uh, physical model, irrespective of whether it's potential energy or something. It's just that the particles move downhill away from the unstable equilibrium points, uh, and then they oscillate around the stable equilibrium points. So if we just drop this down here, uh, the little skate human will just oscillate back and forth about this equilibrium point here at the center. Okay. All right, so let's conclude with some ideas and try to stitch these all together. We've broadly classified all forces into two categories. Are they conservative forces or are they non-conservative forces? Conservative forces have potential energies. They have work that is independent of the path taken. And so the examples we've dealt with are gravity and springs. Non-conservative forces uh, depend on, have work that depends on the path taken. If you take a longer path, you'll do more work than if you take a shorter path, in the case of something like friction or air resistance. No non-conservative slash path dependent work uh, force has a potential energy associated with it. It, can, it does not depend only on the starting and the finishing positions. It depends on how you got there. And therefore, you must uh, depend on the... Um, and therefore, you cannot have a potential energy that I could associate with a... Um, uh, to potential energy that I could associate with it. So that gives us kind of our parent umbrella. Uh, and for the most part, one dimension is going to do us uh, just fine. But 
We live in a three-dimensional world, so it's worth spending the last little chunk of this lecture here going over how that three-dimensional world works with respect to potential energies and with respect to forces. Beyond the first dimension. So in two dimensions and three dimensions, the relationship between potential energy and forces holds along each dimension independently. And that's pretty wild, but it's kind of the best of all possible calculus worlds. And so to figure out the force, what we do is we take the derivative acting only along one of the directions, and that's the force in that direction. And so we're going to write this down in the following notation. Then we're going to explain the notation, but let me explain how we're uh, writing this down. As we say that the force associated with some, in this case, three-dimensional potential is the derivative of that potential with respect to x in the i-hat direction. Then it's the derivative of that potential with respect to y in the j-hat direction. And then the derivative with respect to z, that's definitely a z, not an x, uh, acting in the k-hat direction. So this gives us this nice kind of three-dimensional model we stick a negative on it because that's the negative for the work energy. And this is how we get to a force field, which is just to take the derivative in the x direction. That's the x force. Y direction, it's the y force. Z direction, that's the z force. And then we have a couple weird things going on. First off, that's not a D. It's some sort of weird, funky, uh, swirly thing. And that is what we call a partial derivative, which means only consider the change in the x direction. It's the best kind of high dimensional derivative. And if we take this uh, general operator of doing partial x, uh, partial with respect to x of the force in the x direction, partial with respect to y in the j hat direction, and partial with respect to z in the k hat direction, that kind of forms a way of taking the derivative of a multidimensional function. And we will call this the gradient and give it a little upside down triangle symbol here because it's awesome. Um, and it's kind of like a superior delta. It's upside down. Uh, we'll call this the gradient operator. Don't worry. This sounds intense. You don't have to know how to do this yet. I just am plugging into the future so that you get a nice smooth ride as you sail through higher dimensions. So let's talk about how we actually define a partial derivative. Three dimensions is awesome. That's where we live. I like it here. But let's talk mostly about two dimensions. Let's consider a two-dimensional function of u of x, y. So this is basically a potential at, uh, everywhere in two-dimensional space. That is going to be uh, a partial derivative is going to be using the limit definition of a derivative only in the x direction. So you see the little x plus h minus u of x uh, and minus, uh, divided by h. And then we get the uh, partial of y is the limit of u of x, y uh, and shift by little k minus the uh, potential at x, y. And then we divide by k as that gets smaller and smaller. And that's how we carry out the partial derivative. And basically, mechanically, it's if you look at the derivative, treat every other variable as a constant. Let's do some examples like this. Well, let's take the derivative of uh, this potential. And to calculate the partial of that potential with respect to x, we look at this and we say, let's treat everything but the x as a constant. So here's nx, so we actually have to pay attention to it. So that becomes 3 alpha x squared. But then we look at the second term, there's no x's in there. That's basically just a constant. And the derivative of a constant is 0, so that's 3 alpha x squared plus 0. Derivative complete. Partial of u with respect to y, well, that's uh, the first term is 0. There's no y's in it. And then the second one is plus 2 beta times y. Uh, so this is 3 alpha x squared. And then this one is just 2 beta y. Done. Uh, so let's. what happens if they're multiplied together? Well, let's consider the partial of u with respect to x in this second case here. 
Uh, well, we treat the alpha just like we treat the y to the fifth as constants, bring them out in front, and then take the derivative of the x. So then we get that this is alpha times y to the fifth times six, oh, sorry, seven x to the sixth. And then the partial of u with respect to y, why that is um, alpha x to the seventh, that's all a constant, times five y to the fourth. And so rewriting these, we get that this is seven alpha uh, y to the fifth x to the sixth, and this is uh, five alpha x to the seven y to the fourth. So it's really just take a derivative, but ignore all the other variables for that partial. So let's actually take the derivative here, uh, doing some chain rule action. So the partial of this bottom one, partial of u with respect to x, well, the chain rule says we constant in front uh, stays there. We take the derivative of sine, and that's a cosine. So cos of x cubed y squared over l cubed. Then we take the derivative of whatever's inside of that, and we are taking a partial, so we treat the y squared and the l cubed as a constant. So this just becomes 3x squared y squared over l cubed. And then the partial of the function with respect to y is you do the same thing, but you treat all the x's as constant. So this becomes u naught times the cosine of x cubed y squared over l cubed, and then we take the derivative of everything, but we leave inside, and then we leave the x cubed over l cubed as a constant, and then we multiply that by the derivative of y squared, and that's 2y. So it looks gory, but mechanically you just treat everything as constants except for the variable you're taking the partial. <laughs> okay. So let's wrap up by kind of illustrating a uh, force and a potential and uh, consider it, uh, come back to where we started, which is by taking the work integral of a force along a path. Well, we have to start out by figuring out what the force is. Fortunately, we've got a tool for that, which is that the force is going to be negative partial u with respect to x of i hat minus partial u with respect to x, y in the j hat direction. And so uh, the partial of this expression with respect to x, we just take the derivative of the x and ignore the y squared, and then we take a negative sign. So this becomes 3, oops, it becomes 3x squared y squared i hat. And then we take the derivative of the uh, potential with respect to y hat. Uh, in this case, uh, we pull down. Uh, we treat the x cubed as a constant. So we get plus uh, x cubed. And then we take the derivative of y squared and we get 2y. And that's in the j hat direction. So we calculated the force field from the potential in two dimensions. Now, let's do those uh, path integrals. So we're going to do this one in two parts. We're going to do part, branch one and branch two. And when we're doing these integrals, we're going to consider the integral along path one is going to be from the origin zero, zero to this point here, which is two, zero. Uh, so we go zero, zero to two, zero of the force, which is... Um, I'll write it out once, 3x squared y squared i hat plus 2x cubed y j hat. And then we're going to dot product that with the uh, path uh, or uh, a step along the path. So it's in the x direction. And so this is just going to be dx times i hat. Uh, okay, so we take the dot product there. And so that's the i hat that i hat. The j hat term goes away. So we are left with the integral from 0, 0 to 2, 0 of 3x squared y squared i dot i dot goes to 1 dx. And integrals 
work a lot like uh, partial derivatives in that you only integrate the thing that you have a dx for or a d for. So this says treat the 3y squared as a constant. So that says 3y squared integral from 0, 0 to 2, 0 of um, x squared dx. And that's equal to 3y squared x cubed Oh, over 3, evaluated from 0, 0 to 2, 0. Now, what we do is we have to plug in the x and the y values for those points. So we start out, and we do that this is the 3's cancel. So we do x cubed, which is going to be 2 cubed times y squared. So that's 0 squared minus the starting point, which is going to be 0 cubed times 0 squared. So this is 0. It was a lot of work to get an answer of 0, but, you know, all good physics problems uh, kind of work out to be like 0 or 2 pi. Um, so uh, this was a 0. Cool. Um, then we're going to do branch 2. So we're already at 2, 0, and we're going to go on up to 2, 1. So we consider that to be the integral from 2 comma 0 to 2 comma 1 of f dot ds. In this case, my force is the same. I'll write it out again. 2, 0, uh, 2, 1 of uh, 3x squared y squared i hat plus 2x cubed y j hat dotted with dy times j hat, because we're stepping up in the vertical direction, and so we're going to integrate and move up in the y direction, and so we cancel out uh, the i dot j term, and we are left with an integral from 2, 0 to 2, 1 of, uh, dot those all out, we get 2x cubed y dy, and when we integrate that, we get x cubed y squared evaluated at, oh, so yeah, yeah that's correct, at uh, 2, 0 to 2, 1. So we will plug those in. So we start out by saying x equals 2, so that's 2 cubed times y, uh, y is 1, so that's 1 squared, minus, then we plug in the bottom, 2, 0, which is going to be 2 cubed times 0 squared, and that's going to be 8 in math units because we are not sort of carrying along physics units for purposes of this uh, integration example. That's fantastic. So we integrated, we have a potential, and uh, we went uh, from 0, 0 to 2, 1. And we got, uh, along that path, we got an answer of 8. Well, um, that's the work. We could also, of course, have evaluated the change in the potential energy is negative the work. And so that's minus, uh, let's see here, uh, let's see here, x cubed is minus uh, 2 cubed times 1 squared minus 0 cubed times 0 squared. That's plugging in the 2, 1 and the 0, 0 points. And then that's equal to negative 8. And that is indeed uh, the negative of the answer we just did our path uh, from. So we could calculate it with potentials, or we could calculate it with forces, and we'd get the same answer. Okay, so that's really cool. But let's continue this problem. Let's get a little more practice doing uh, path work. And what we want to do is to go back. Uh, so we came in this direction. So we went along the bottom and then went up and got to this point, we want to go from here back to the origin and figure out what the work is for that. And so uh, if we do that, then we're going to have a couple more um, paths to consider. We have a 3 and a 4 to consider. And so path 3 is going to be the integral of my force, which is uh, 3x Oops, this is the wrong force. Um, pay no attention to this force. We are dealing with the potential minus x cubed y squared. Yes, this is a lame force. You don't want to do that. 3x uh, 
x squared y x squared y squared i hat plus um uh two x cubed y j hat dotted with my path and my path here is going to go from two one to two uh to zero one because this point here is zero one and so this is going to be dy in the oh sorry dx in the i hat direction and so we will integrate from two comma one to zero comma one of three x squared y squared and that's the i hats um uh dot into each other leaving me behind that value and then we uh the i dot j will cancel out so there's no uh second term and then we can integrate that so we get that this is x cubed y squared evaluated at 2 1 to 0 1 and here signs are important so we start out by sticking in the zero x equals 0 y equals 1 so 0 cubed 1 squared minus and then we have um let's see here 2 cubed 2 cubed times 1 squared and that's equal to negative 8. Okay so the work along that path is negative 8 and then let's do the work along path 4. So the work along path 4 is going to go from 0 1 up down to 0 0 and then we have the force dotted with ds and then that's going to only have the y component of the term because my ds is going to be, uh, so this is going to be 2x cubed y j hat dotted with dy in the j hat direction from 0, 1 to 0, 0. I have not bothered writing down the first term because I know it's going to go away with the dot product, so it'll cancel out. And so I come back to this result. Uh, which is 2x cubed y dy integrated from 0, 1 down to 0, 0. And that's going to be 2x cubed uh, y squared over 2 from 0, 1 to 0, 0. Again, I've just pulled out the 2x cubed, integrated y dy, and got y squared over 2. Those 2s will cancel. And then I evaluate x cubed y squared evaluated at 0, 0, and 0, 1. And that's going to be 0 cubed times 0 squared minus 0 cubed times 1 squared, known to all my people as 0. OK, so let's just take a quick refresher on where we were. We did a whole bunch of path integrals, and that was mostly an example of how to think about paths and potentials and forces and stuff like that. Uh, and we found that the path there was, uh, path uh, work along the first path was zero, then it was eight, then it was negative eight, and then it was zero. And this shows a vital part of conservative forces, which is if I go around a closed path, the potential energy where I start and finish is the same because it's I'm returning to where I start. And so the work done around that path must be zero uh, total. So you can pick up some work and then give it back uh, as you're going around uh, the circle and uh, get back there. And this is a demonstration and it's a property of conservative forces. If you execute a path integral and you find, uh, you come back to where you started and you've done non-zero work, then there is no potential energy. It's a non-conservative force. However, this is the warning noise. If you find the work done around one closed path that does not is zero, that doesn't prove that the force is conservative. It needs to be zero for all possible paths. And that's kind of tricky. So you might wonder if there is a way to look at a force or a type of force and figure out whether it's conservative or not just by looking at it without seeing the potential. And there is. 
and I'm going to leave it to my fine colleagues in the future to explain exactly how to do it. It'll curl your hair. All right, I think that's all we got to say today. Uh, thanks for everything, and I will uh, see you later. Bye.